Hey there! Thanks for tuning in to Duck Bricks. I'm Chris, and welcome to another episode of Bionicle Fanon Reviews, where I review every fan-created, canonized Bionicle model. These are not official sets, but instead they are fan-created models accepted officially into the Bionicle Generation 1 storyline either via Lego contests like the Dark Hunter or Rahi contest in 2005, or stuff like the TTV canonization contests, which are actually still ongoing and overseen by Greg Farshti, the current story herald of the Bionicle universe. Today we'll be taking a look at a Dark Hunter named Fire Dracax. Now, Fire Dracax's story is a very unique one compared to most Dark Hunters. He is fueled by one thing and one thing only, a hatred of Viserac. He was once a Tomatoran living on an unnamed island when their island was beset by the Viserac Horde. Eventually, although many of his companions were killed, he and a few of his friends were able to flee all the way until they were backed into a corner and had to dive into a pool of energized protodermis to escape the Viserac. While all of his companions died during that immersion, he was mutated and transformed into someone fueled by a hatred of Viserac and joined the Dark Hunters simply to kill Viserac. As such, he only takes on missions where Viserac are going to be killed or taken care of, which makes him a particularly effective opponent in very specific cases. He is also the closest thing to an anti-hero and not quite villain amongst the Dark Hunters ranks because, of course, he is doing the world a big favor by wiping out the Viserac, which nobody likes. So, going into this actual model, there's one thing I do have to get out of the way before we start. If any of you own the Dark Hunters book, you might be thinking that this looks nothing like the actual picture in the model. Now, this is a very controversial choice because when LEGO received this model in the mail, they looked at the ball joint on the torso there and were like, huh, I think the head should go on there. And so they took his head, stuck it in the middle of his torso, bent his body backwards, and otherwise contorted him such that his head was sticking out of his torso. He had no head where his neck was, and they built it completely wrong. They also reversed the direction of his head. So everything that LEGO did in the Dark Hunter book was wrong. And we know this because the original builder of this mock posted a photo of what it actually looked like before he sent it in, which is exactly this. So for those of you who might be wondering about the discrepancy in canon, personally in my opinion I chose to do this for basically two reasons. One, I always like to stick to the original intent of the builder of the model. Lego obviously made a blatant mistake and in the canon depiction, unfortunately the depiction is a mistake. His head was on his torso. But I also think that it just simply looks a lot better and is a lot more stable in this configuration. You see the torso is actually held on by this ball joint as a major structural component. And what LEGO did is they removed it and stuck his head on it instead. So it makes the entire back of his torso very flimsy, almost impossible to pose. So for those two major reasons, I'm deciding to stick to this actual model. Now, I actually stuck very close to the actual model while building this. There are a few very minor color and part substitutions, particularly in the staff, it was supposed to use a much longer continuous red Technic axle. I unfortunately do not have long red Technic axles, so I just joined together a bunch of shorter red ones, which hopefully shouldn't make too, too much of a difference. And there's just some very minor things like uh, choices being used in transparent red instead of just regular red and whatnot. But other than that, this is basically what you would see in a standard Canon model. This basically reflects the image pretty perfectly. But so without further ado, I will explain my criteria for reviewing these models on four major points. Number one is posability. So how well can I get this into unique and good poses without it falling over? Can it support the weight of its own weapon? Is it able to pose well without having to be continuously readjusted? Number two is building techniques. So does this simply take stuff from the sets and use them in different configurations? Or is there actually something more unique going on here? And are there any parts being used in a more unique manner? Number three is overall aesthetics. So completely agnostic of story. How well does this look as a dark hunter? Does this look menacing? Does this look like a formidable warrior that you would not want to face? And number four is just overall how well does it fit in the Bionicle universe and in particular does it make sense as a mutated Tomatoran and as a now Dark Hunter. 
So keeping all that in mind, let's dive in right into the review and take a look at Fire Drake Hacks The Dark Hunter. All right, so here we can see a 360 degree turnaround of Fire Dracax, the Dark Hunter. So you can see all sorts of parts usages and see him from all angles. The one thing that will become immediately apparent to some viewers is that yes, I did 3D print the Leecon shield piece there. I simply wasn't willing to spend $20 per half on Bricklink. I don't even know if there are enough examples of that being sold on Bricklink to be able to build all of the canonized models because pretty much almost every single Dark Hunter uses it in some way, shape, or form. So it's a very rare piece, only came with Toa Lee Khan and Kikinalo, so it doesn't make sense for me to buy that just to use for these models. And the 3D printed one works out perfectly fine just to showcase the model itself. But without further ado, let's just dive right into this model and remove it from the turnaround platform. Alright, so starting off with posability, the one thing that you'll probably notice almost immediately is that this thing, unfortunately, is yet another model that is not very stable. At least he can support the weight of his weapon, kind of, but if you move around the legs even just a little bit, he immediately just flops over to one side. The legs cannot support the weight of this build, but thankfully this is something that can be very easily fixed by adding in a friction joint adder from the CCBS line of things. As it is right now though, nearly impossible to pose him with the current leg configuration. I have even tried strengthening the legs by swapping out the hand pieces with the CCBS pieces, which do a little bit in terms of helping, but it's still not really that great. And the one thing you'll notice is that when posing him, it's very awkward to pose and the arms fall off almost immediately. That is because if you look at the way that the arms are added on, they're simply just pins connected to the Toa Metru torso piece here. So if I stick this in, I get it in all the way there, you'll notice the Mata foot is very much wedged in one straight position. If you kind of move around the arm a little bit, it immediately starts to pull out of the back. This is a, basically an illegal building technique. There's really no way to get it such that it stays in one place and you can actually move the arm around. The moment that you start to move this arm up, it starts to push out and really that's where you can get it to very easily fall out of the socket. So that's a big con in terms of posability. I think just not enough thought went into exactly how this was mounted. They very easily could have just moved the foot up one notch and mounted it flat on one angle straight outwards. That would have at least made it so that you could move the arm outwards. But as it is right now, that's pretty weak. That's a really bad connection and it's really unfortunate just not being able to pose this. The other thing that you may notice about the arms is that they are another one having triple jointed arms. So you've got an upper section, a middle section, a lower section, and a hand. That works for some characters, but honestly for this one, it kind of works out a little bit better, mostly because the Hordika Vakama masks really restrict the movement of this middle section. You can't really move it past this point, so if you really want to imagine it, you can think of this as one large upper arm and then one really short lower arm segment that he uses to hold on to his weapons here. It's not the perfect setup and it's very awkward. There goes his arm again. It's really easy to kind of knock the arm out because again, it's using an illegal technique to adhere these arms because they're just constantly being forced apart. Moving into the head, obviously there's nothing too crazy going on with it. You can kind of rotate it along different ball joints and it kind of has this almost singular eye, like almost like a sentry or a very unique design. The official Canon model had it turned around which used kind of the shaping of the foot piece as a bill and eyes here. I actually do kind of prefer it the way that the creator intended like this though. It just gives it a much more mysterious vibe and makes it look like it's a monolithic cyclops that's just staring at you. As we move away from posability and start to talk about building techniques, I'm actually going to remove one of the arms because it is going to keep falling off and I can just illustrate how the torso is built a little bit better that way. The first thing that you will notice is that it has this very awkward spike on its rear end here. It's a very flimsy thing and unfortunately there's no friction in between here. So 
These can just move around freely as they choose, and the way that it's mounted here causes a lot of strain on these Borok limb pieces in particular. It's really not that great of a build, and unfortunately, a lot of the other parts of this torso are actually really good. I like the way that the feet pieces on the side here kind of form this angular shaping. They combined the Metru torso alongside a Borok ribcage, Rakshi feet, and legs almost perfectly, it's just this whole construction in the back simply does not hold up and unfortunately if you took off all of this the model would not work and would basically just fall apart because that's the only thing holding the legs on. So the builder clearly just couldn't come up with an easy way to attach the leg hip piece here and they had to come up with this weird crazy bottom construction here that really just makes it look really awkward and not really all that threatening if you look at it especially from the side profile. If you look up here, the torso is really just being held on by ball joints and rubber bands. You'll notice that as I wiggle this, it wiggles a lot because this is not actually held on in a firm manner at all. It's literally just held on loose and the rubber band is the only thing that's actually keeping it from just rotating all the way. That being said, you can maybe kind of see it as a pro because I guess he has waist articulation, kind of. Not really intentional waist articulation, but waist articulation nonetheless. But then moving on to the lower part here, as we're talking about aesthetics, it's kind of strange to me how the rubber bands are in white. I understand that that's really the only color that they come in, but they really do kind of stand out for the character. And I find it really funny how obviously this rubber band is necessary and this rubber band is necessary because they actually hold the pieces in. But these ones were completely unnecessary. And this is actually one thing I kind of like about the build is that the designer actually put rubber bands here to make it completely aesthetic and cohesive with the rest of the build because I, they probably felt and I would agree that it was very strange having just one rubber band here, one rubber band here that is a completely wrong color compared to the rest of the very red color scheme. So they decided that hey why not use it as an accent color and use it to kind of break up the monotony of the red here. So. That's honestly something I kind of like about it. I think that that was a good choice to use. It's not going to be everyone's favorite method because a lot of people will be wondering why this useless rubber band is here and here. But for me personally, I think it does kind of act as a highlight color and it makes this and this a lot more excusable when it's placed here as an intentional decision. So that is one thing I do like about it. Moving on to the weapons themselves that he's actually holding, the staff, of course, is very, very basic. Oh, there he goes falling over again. It's literally just the Hordika Vakama fire staff placed on top of a long red Technic shaft, and then a Rotuka launcher kind of awkwardly placed in as well. So it's not the most complex of staffs, but you know what? I will take it because if they did anything more complex than this, it would not be able to support its own weight and would be constantly flopping around and falling over. So you know what? Having a simple weapon is not necessarily a bad thing because if you look at any of the other fan-created canonized Dark Hunters in particular, they cannot support the weight of their own weapons, which is a major con. This one, however, can, so I'll give it that. The other weapon here that he uses is basically a standard shield. It's basically totally con shield with Vaki staffs added onto it. And unfortunately, this one absolutely cannot support its own weight. So that is a con against both posability and I guess parts choice here because you can see that adding on to the flimsiness of the arm, having this kind of heavy weapon isn't that great. The one upside to this is that you can basically just balance the shield on the front of his leg and essentially this is really the only configuration you can get, but it's really the only configuration you'd want anyway. So it's not that big of a deal when compared to some other weapons that would look better if they could raise them up but simply can't. This one can simply just sit there and be perfectly fine. So that's one thing that works out great to me as we move into the rest of the build here in terms of aesthetics. Of course, the color scheme is very, very consistent. It's just very red and dark red. And really, those are all the colors you're gonna see. I also will note that the eyes should be a lighter shade of green. I just didn't have the right green on me. But other than that, the color scheme is basically very solidly red, which is also both a pro and a con. I like the consistency, 
but it also does kind of feel like all the red kind of clumps together. There isn't really anything visually distinct about the way that the torso is built. The parts can kind of blend together, and I would have actually appreciated a little bit more color variety in here. Maybe if they took even a white rubber band and wrapped it around the front of the torso, or did something a little bit more unique with the way that the color blocking is achieved. As of right now, it's nothing too, too crazy. And of course, the arms being fully dark red and the torso, front legs being red, and then just a dark red piece here and back to matter red. Feels just a little bit like it's just one solid blob of color. And it's not like it's actually laid out in a unique way. So that can be a con to some in that it's a little bit plain. As we move it to the side and back, this is where the problems really start to become apparent because the bulkiness of the back, let's say, uh, the back armor here really just stands out significantly, makes him look really not that menacing, and that's something that does detract a lot from aesthetics, in my opinion, is just the way that the back is constructed, such that it has this massive thing kind of sticking out of the back. And again, there he goes, falling over, posability is a major issue with the set. Continuing along the back, this very awkward Technic beam across here does it no favors, and while I actually do like this part of the build, having the Borok rib cages serve as kind of lift arms going up to the Mata or Metru torso, this part right here just almost completely ruins the entire model, because it's just very awkward, unwieldy, and unfortunately necessary. You can see that as I kind of spread this apart, nothing's actually attaching this to the actual torso. So. Literally just the rubber band is keeping it on here. Not a very strong rubber band at that, so I'm kind of worried about the long-term viability of this model. And you've got all sorts of things falling off, the arms continuously falling off. Just not a great model in general, and not one that I'm really happy to have on a shelf because of just how strange it is to pose and move around and kind of flex like this. So. Eh, it's a mixed bag, that's for sure. There are some things I really like about it, some things I really don't. But now we can move on to the final point, which is how well does this fit in the Bionicle universe shown next to some representative samples? Let's zoom out and take a look. All right, so zooming out and taking a look at the final point of this review, how well does this make sense in the universe? Here is Fire Dracax alongside a Visorak, one of the creatures he hates so much as well as alongside a Toa for a representative size comparison. You can immediately see that this does actually fit in okay with the universe. I think that the main red color scheme does actually kind of blend in with some of the other color schemes of the Toa. The head is obviously very alien and out there, but that is something I do like about it, is that how different it is and how unique it looks as a headpiece. It doesn't just look like another character's face slapped onto it. And you can see that he scales pretty well alongside a Visorak, such that, I mean, you can very easily see him defeating large hordes of these, but he's not so overwhelmingly big that you can imagine it, that if there was a large swarm of Visorak, they could get the better of him. So it's definitely posing a fight and a challenge against him, and they do scale well next to each other. That being said, there are some kind of strange things about the build that don't quite make sense to me especially in terms of just the way that the body is shaped, the stature, the head especially, all these things that I do like that are kind of unique about him just kind of make it not fit in perfectly with the rest of the universe. And so for that, I'm going to give it a 7 out of 10. Obviously, this is a Bionicle model. It looks like it fits in the Bionicle G1 universe, but only to an extent. The head is so out there that it doesn't look like anything else we've seen ever before, so... That's kind of something that sets it apart. The way that the arms are structured with a really large upper arm, a really short lower arm, just kind of make it feel a little bit awkward and make things stand out that makes the viewer or someone looking at this kind of have to look twice before considering it as part of the Bionicle universe. So in terms of how well it fits, again, that's a seven out of 10. Moving aside the representative Visorak and Toa, let's take a look at the just overall aesthetics of this. And I think the point where it really hurts the most here is, again, the way it looks from the back. He has this, like, massive build on the back, all just to make sure that he has the legs attached. I feel like there's a lot better things that you could do to make the legs attach. I mean, I can think of one literally right off the top of my head. Stick a ball joint onto that Visorag ribcage there, 
and stick the legs onto that ball joint. Is it a little less stable? Sure, but then you don't have this whole build in the back that feels very awkward, hard to pose, and very just unwieldy in general in terms of trying to get this to look good as an actual character. The other thing is, again, this is something that I mentioned when we were talking about how well it fits in the universe, but the way that the arms are set up, this is basically just one upper arm, super short lower arm feels very awkward to me. And again, there's just very some very strange things about it that I can't quite get past. But then again, it does do some stuff that I really do like. I like how unique and out there the head design is. I love the kind of Cyclops expression that it has, and it almost feels like a century or something more robotic and unique. It doesn't look like anything we've seen before in the Bionicle universe, and I think that's generally a pretty good thing. So for overall aesthetics, I'm also gonna give this one a seven out of 10. It's dragged down a lot by the back of the model and the side profile looking especially strange with this build on the back, but it is elevated a little bit by the head and some of the parts usages and placement choices here and there. So it's kind of average, a little bit more on the positive side for aesthetics. Now in terms of building techniques, this is where it's gonna get a lot of flack because you saw how easy it was to pop the arms off and if you do have them in a pose that's relatively firm, you can't pose them at all without, well, causing them to fall off again. So that's a major con, a very illegal technique, something I'm very surprised that the builder of this didn't actually try to change around to make it a little bit more stable than that. You've got these very awkward style of limbs that just are connectors that just keep going on straight that would work better in almost like a tail rather than an arm. And then you have this whole thing, which is only mounted on a single ball joint in the back, causes it to be too flexible and you actually had to include rubber bands to limit the movement here. All of these cause it to kind of fall apart when it comes to the build itself. If you're looking at it from a distance, like in terms of the general aesthetics, it's not too bad, but when you actually go up close and personal, it's a very flimsy model. And that's why I'm giving it a five out of 10 in terms of building techniques. This is a particularly weak one in terms of how it's built. Although I will say that the way that Lego built it by putting his head on his chest would have made it 10 times worse. So I'm happy that at least this can kind of stand up and look generally intimidating when facing off against say a Visera. But now onto the final point, which is posability. So posability is a bit of a mixed bag here. And I say that because you can kind of get him into interestingly looking poses, but only if you're very careful on the way that you position parts, you're really careful not to bend the arm out too, too much. And you really have to fiddle with it a lot to get it into a cool pose. That being said, it's not impossible, and it's not like he can't support the weight of his weapon. He actually can, which is a good thing. But then you get to the fact that it can barely stand up on his legs without a lot of movement. He can't support the weight of his shield. And again, he just keeps on wanting to do the splits right there. So posability, I'm going to give a six out of 10. You can get it into good poses. You can get him to stand up in a relatively basic position, which is a lot better than most. But you simply cannot get him to get into super dynamic poses without either significant modification, adding on CCBS ball joint add-ons, or really just fiddling and playing around with how the model works in general. And so for that, I think that about sums up this review of Fire Drake Hacks The Dark Hunter. Let me know down in the comments below, what do you think of this model? Are any of you going to build it on your own? Or have you built this already? And if so, are you experiencing some of these same problems that I am? What do you think of the rest of the Dark Hunters as well? Leave your comments down below on what you want to see reviewed next. And as usual, stay tuned to Duck Pricks for more LEGO news, reviews, discussion, and analyses coming your way very soon. Every Monday, there will be a new Bionicle fan and review posted until otherwise noted. So thank you so much for tuning in, and stay tuned to our next review coming up very soon. Thanks, and bye-bye for now.